This morning, our plan is to continue what we began last week on the doctrine of repentance. So let's open our time in prayer and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for another day to walk on your earth, to breathe your air. We acknowledge our absolute and total dependence upon you as creator and sustainer of all things. We know that if you would cease speaking us into existence, we would cease to be. And yet you have designed that we would be here. And so as your creatures, we are accountable to you. You've designed us to give you all glory and all honor in everything that we do. And we recognize, oh Lord, how far short we come of that glory. We thank you that in the gospel of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we have our sins forgiven, uh, guilt removed as far as the east is from the west. We are yours by adoption through the satisfaction of your wrath by our substitute. And we bank on these things. These eternal objective realities that are outside of us are our ground and our hope. We love the gospel. And Lord, we find ourselves in this mixed condition with a war on inside our hearts. A battle for loyalties. Loyalties to you rather than to the flesh. And we think of Paul's words in Romans 6 where we are commanded not to bring our, our members, our, our mind, our bodies, our faculties, our abilities, our resources, not to bring those into that throne room of the old slave master as weapons for unrighteousness, but to bring our entire selves before you, to offer these resources, abilities as weapons of righteousness, to be used for your glory, Lord, we, we just acknowledge our weakness and we acknowledge this battle inside us. And we pray that this morning you would use your word to equip us in the art of turning, of turning away from sin as an ongoing practice of the Christian life. And we ask for your help in it, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd love for you to open your Bibles this morning to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're looking this morning at a second part of our talk about repentance. Last week, we looked at a practical template for questions to ask ourselves uh, when we are uh, discovering sin. We we learned to ask God, what do you call this sin? To think about it the way he thinks about it. Um, To to discover the, the roots, not just the fruits of errant thinking. Uh, We learn to ask the question, um, how does God feel about our sin? In other words, God's animosity towards sin is much deeper than we think it is. Not only are the definitions and descriptions of sin uh, much deeper than we tend to give them credit, but God's hatred of those things is deeper. And then we ask the question, what did God do about my sin? And if you're in Christ, in the gospel, Uh, we understand that the depths of God's love and the depths of his activities fixing our sin problem are bigger than the problem. Uh, We sin greatly, but we have a greater Savior. Grace is greater than all my sins. And then we learn to ask the question, what must I do about my sin? Uh, We're going to pick up there this morning, uh, really as a, a way of evaluating how are we doing in repenting? And I want to turn your attention to sort of the classic text on this topic. So if you're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, I want you to look down beginning in verse 10. We'll look at two verses that describes biblical repentance. It begins this way, for godly sorrow produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world brings about death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow, has brought about in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. That is the text that is going to guide our time this morning. 
um, in a look at repentance. Now, one of the things that we uh, need to remember is that repentance, a, a turning from sin and a turning from God, is the front door of the Christian life. The, this is how you get into following Christ. You, you turn away from yourself, you turn away from the world, you turn away from Satan, you turn away from sin, you turn away from false gods, false ideologies, false religions, and you turn to the one true God. Uh, this is how Paul describes our salvation in 1 Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. You turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. Salvation there is described as a turning 180 degree shift. I was running that way. I came to faith in Christ. Now I'm running that way. Acts 5.31 describes repentance this way. Granted for forgiveness of sins. Repentance unto salvation is a gift of God. It's like the, the package of faith in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, lest anyone boast. Repentance, the, the flip side of the faith coin. I believe in God. That means I'm turning away from all false beliefs. Repentance is the other side of that coin. Like faith, it is called a gift. Listen to Acts eleven eighteen. God has granted, that's the word for gifted or graced. He has granted to the Gentiles repentance. In Acts 5, 31, Jews are granted repentance. In Acts eleven eighteen, 18, Gentiles are granted repentance. In other words, nobody comes to the repentance of salvation apart from the grace of God as a gift. And similarly, 2 Timothy 2, 25, talking about those who are opposed to the gospel currently, Paul says, correct them gently, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. So you see from the beginning, as we talk about repentance, we can't talk about something that we muster up. We pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. We invent it or create it or produce it. Uh, repentance is something we do. And it is something we do by the power of God, given by the grace of God. We are dependent on him in these things. But repentance is not just the activity of coming to Jesus. Repentance is also to be the activity and the practice of the Christian life. Listen to 1 John 1, 8 and 9. And these are all present tense verbs, which means they are involved in the realm of ongoing Christian living. These are descriptions of ongoing, regular, habitual Christian practice. And John says, if we are saying that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we are confessing our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's important for us to understand that a Christian who thinks he has ceased from sinning in this life is a liar, a liar to himself and to others. There is no such doctrine in the Bible. And, and we can be confused sometimes coming into the Christian life, being forgiven of our sins, and then sinning and thinking, whoa, what is wrong? And the reality is, Entrance into the Christian life brings an awareness of sin you never had before, a battle for it internally, and produces repentance as an ongoing practice of the Christian life. This is to be our regular habit. And biblical repentance is not, and I'm going to give you a list of things repentance is not. Biblical repentance is not getting caught. That's not repentance. Uh, biblical, uh, biblical repentance is not equal to recognition. Whether you got caught or felt pricked in your conscience, discovered it yourself, read a Bible verse and said, oh, that displeases the Lord. I see it now. Recognition of sin is not repentance. Now think about Pharaoh in Exodus 9.27 who after several plagues into the problems he created for Egypt says, I've sinned against the Lord. Well, he wasn't repentant. Uh, he recognized that what he was doing was sin. Didn't like the consequences of it. Balaam, likewise, the, the false prophet who was forced by God to speak truly sometimes, 
in Numbers 22, 34, similarly says, I've sinned. Pray to your God for me. And Balaam was not repentant. He was not a believer, but he recognized sin. So recognition of sin is not the same as repentance. And then confession of sin is, is not repentance. Uh, even when Saul goes to Samuel in 1 Samuel 15, 30, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. And then in the very next breath, Saul says, hey, will you go with me so that I will still be esteemed by the people? Saul has not put his sins to death. He, he still loves the prestige. He wants to be seen as king. He wants to be seen as the ruler. He wants to be esteemed by the people. He's not brokenhearted. He's not contrite. He hasn't repented, even though he has confessed. And biblical repentance is not the catharsis that comes with confession. Uh, you know the cathartic effect. I, I got this off my chest. I just, I said it out loud and now I feel better. I've been carrying a weight of secrecy. Now it's no longer a secret. And emotionally, I feel light. That's not biblical repentance. That's just the relief of getting something off your chest. And biblical repentance is not regret. Do you remember Judas Iscariot, the betrayer of our Lord? Not repentant. Although he took the 30 pieces of silver, walked back into the Jewish leadership and threw it into the ground, <laughs> said, I betrayed innocent blood. He knew what he did was wrong. He regretted it. He even made some sort of financial return. And yet his sorrow ended up in suicide. It, it was not a sorrow of faith. It was not the kind of biblical sorrow of repentance described in the passage we'll look at this morning. It was just regret. Additionally, promises are not repentance. I promise to do better. Never again, Lord. Do you remember the promise that Peter made to Jesus? I will never deny you. I will die with you. Consequences are not repentance. Sometimes we think, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm really getting the discipline here and the consequences. I, I'm getting the fruits of my sins. And so I am therefore repentant because these things are happening to me. Uh, that is passive. And, and the consequences of sin may help us to feel the gravity of sin. And, and often they produce in us a desire to have relief from those consequences a desire for relief from consequences of sin is not biblical repentance. Repentance is not feeling the gravity of your consequences or wanting the relief of it. In the, in the old movie, The Mission, there was a, a murderer who uh, became a Catholic, decided to turn his life around and imbibed the, the idea that he had to make up for all of his crimes and if you saw the movie, you may remember him with a, with a giant net full of pots and pans and him crawling up a waterfall uh, as this sort of making up for what he had done. It's, it's reminiscent of, of Luther in Rome uh, crawling on his knees up the steps of St. Peter's. And the idea was you, you have to suffer, you have to do hard things, you have to inflict damage to yourself in order to make up for your crimes. And of course, the, the folly of that is, is double folly to, to reject the free offer of grace in Jesus Christ for forgiveness of sins and then replace it with a self-righteousness, which is actually just more sin, increasing your liability before God. So the consequences aren't repentance and, and certainly craving to make consequences for yourself is not repentance. And then finally, forgiveness is not equal to repentance. And forgiveness is critical. Um, but there's a, there's a sense in which we can think about repentance as one popular author, maybe a decade or so ago, said you just need to hit the refresh button on your justification. Just, just rehearse the gospel this way. Jesus paid for it. We're good. Where you just sort of start over again uh, with the acknowledgement that Jesus paid for sins. Now, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, 
Of course we must rehearse the gospel and remember that Jesus paid for our sins. It's, it's one of the reasons that the church practices regularly the remembrance of Jesus' death in the Lord's table. It, it brings us back to the foot of the cross over and over and over again, the only place we can have forgiveness. But that in and of itself is not repentance. You know the proverb 26.11 that says, like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. And if all we have in our idea of repentance is, is sort of refreshing the idea of forgiveness, then we've done something like the Roman Catholic confessional. You, you go into the box, you get absolution, you do the things and the ceremonies, and you walk out and you live like the devil the rest of the week. You're not making plans for life change. You're, you're not actually turning. And, and, and if you grew up as a, as a practicing Catholic, you would probably testify to the reality of what you did on Saturday nights and how you fix it on Sunday morning and go through the cycle again and again and again. Now, that is not biblical repentance. So as we come to this text, 2 Corinthians 7 I want to back up to verse 8 and, and sort of have an on-ramp to, to what we'll call 13 descriptions of a biblical repentance. Look at verse 8. Paul says, I caused you sorrow by my letter. I do not regret it, though I did regret it. <laughs> what does Paul mean by that? Uh, he didn't want anybody to, to feel sorrow for sorrow's sake. He, he's going to weep with the brothers who weep, and yet the sorrow they experienced was important, and Paul was willing to be a vehicle to that end. So that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. He says in, in uh, verse 9, I now rejoice, I'm sorry, uh, back in verse 8, my letter caused you sorrow for a while, but I now rejoice, though you were made sorrowful, you were made sorrowful unto Repentance. For you were made to have godly sorrow, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. And that leads us into this discussion of, of godly sorrow. Now there is some sort of debate in the commentaries about this context, and, and what letter is Paul talking about, and, and what sin did the Corinthian believers commit? What did Paul need to address? What were they brought to godly sorrow over, and what did they change? Uh, some would say that um, there was an antagonist of Paul between 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, and the Corinthian believers had entertained criticisms of Paul, and, and they needed to repent and turn from that, uh, while others would say this is a reference to the, the discipline situation from 1st Corinthians 5. The Corinthian believers had tolerated an immoral man in their midst. The letter of 1st Corinthians was written in part to address that, and they turned from that and were to welcome him into the fellowship in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and 2. I take that view. Um, I know it's not a settled case, but I think Paul here is referring to the events from 1 Corinthians over here in 2 Corinthians. And whatever the per particular circumstance, it's clear that Paul is describing a turn, a repentance, and this is what's important, in the lives of believers. He's not here with the Corinthians describing how to become a Christian. He's describing how does a Christian turn from sin in the Christian life? What does it look like? So what we have here is a grid for evaluating how you respond to your own sin. And, and that's important. We're, this is not first and foremost a grid for you to evaluate how someone else is turning from his sin. Uh, there are times to help others see what they need to see. But, but first and foremost, this is a grid for helping us evaluate how are we turning from our own sin. We will have here 13 descriptions of, of what Paul calls the sorrow of repentance. A sorrow working out repentance. A sorrow producing repentance. And sorrow is the subject grammatically of these two verses, verses 10 and 11. And it's a certain kind of sorrow. It is a sorrow that works or brings about or, or makes, produces repentance. This is repentant sorrow. And what's revealed here is a disposition of the heart that responds to sin in a biblical manner with godly sorrow that produces the fruit of repentance. So the descriptions of that repentant sorrow 
are in here. And we'll notice, even, even though last week we, we talked about our sin in terms of a vertical component, how are you dealing with your sin with God? We will notice in these verses, there is not only the vertical component, but also a horizontal one. How our sin affects others and, and what must be done. So let's look at these 13 descriptions of a sorrow-producing repentance to help me evaluate my response to my own sin. Biblical repentance is, first of all, godly. Godly. Look at verse 10. Godly sorrow produces repentance. Literally, this is according to God, an according to God kind of sorrow. A kind of sorrow that meets the standard that belongs to God about how we should feel about our sin. When our attitude towards sin reflects God's attitude towards sin. And, and our feeling about sin the way God feels about sin is, ours is to approach His. And, and, and we might refer to this as an asymptotal approximation. Well, uh, it gets closer and closer and closer, but never reaches it. Why? Because in, in our finite, puny minds, we will never see sin as deep and as dark as it truly is. We, we will never understand God's holy, pure character for all of its infinite grandeur. And so we will never have a right estimation of sin. Bottom line is, Christian, you have, and you are now, and you will always underestimate sin. Now, that doesn't mean uh, getting into a morbid introspection and second-guessing everything. We'll get to that in a few weeks. <laughs> That's another equipping hour. But just understand the relationship of us to our sin and a holy God. Um, we're, we're trying to see it according to God. That is, we're trying to bring our sorrow in line with how God feels about our sin. That's what he means by a godly sorrow. Secondly, this sorrow-producing repentance is active. Look at verse 10. Godly sorrow produces, produces. That is, it brings about. This is the normal word for work. This is an ongoing activity of work. Sorrow is the subject. Sorrow is doing something. Godly sorrow is up to something. And what does godly sorrow work? What does it, what does it produce? What is its activity? It brings about Repentance, the, the 180 degree turn that we're talking about. The sorrow is not passive. The sorrow is not a point in time. It, it, this is an ongoing work. As, as Thomas Boston wrote in his book, Repentance, Turning from Sin to God, he said, this is more than a day's work. This is an ongoing process. It's the ongoing work in a Christian life to renew our turning from sin and unto God. Uh, this is a, a refining work, an ongoing work. And, and the more you peel the layers of an onion, or to use last week's illustration, the, the more you see the, the fruits attached to the branches, attached to the trunk, attached to the roots, growing in the soils of various kinds of unbelief, the, the more you sort of pull it apart and evaluate the sin itself. Uh, the more the sorrow brings about this repentance as its work. It is active. This sorrow is godly, it is active, and thirdly, it is Christian. It is Christian. What do I mean by that? I mean it belongs to the Christian life. This is possible only for believers. We see this. This godly sorrow produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. It is a repentance unto salvation. This is important for us to understand. This is a kind of repentance that only a Christian can work out. It is a repentance with a destination. Unto salvation. And, and clear in this context, Paul is writing to believers who have already been saved. The salvation described here is not the new birth entrance into the Christian life. The salvation described here is the final destination. And the New Testament talks about our salvation this way as something that has been done, something that is being done, and something that will be finalized. You have been saved, you are being saved, and you will be saved. All of those are good biblical truths. This one focuses on that destination part of salvation. You've already been positionally saved, judicially declared righteous. You possess an unlosable salvation in the gospel. What is Paul saying here? This kind of godly sorrow producing repentance, uh, 
produces a repentance that is in the sphere of salvation, in the realm of that salvation path. It's on the path of life. It belongs only to those who have the spirit, only those who have been given the gift of repentance initially, who will invariably experience salvation after this life is through. As we think about this phrase, a a repentance unto salvation, and and really this, this text is given for us to evaluate our response to sin, there is sort of an ultimate evaluation embedded in this phrase. If you were to discover, for instance, that you've never experienced godly sorrow, that the 13 descriptions here just don't match up in any form or fashion with your responses to your own sin then you're not dealing with the kind of repentance that is on this path of life. And so an ultimate question is critical here. As you think through this evaluation, you can be asking the question, and and if you fall short in this, categorically short, you ought to be asking the question, am I on the path of life? (laughs) Have I seen my sin at all? Is my turning from sin lined up with this description? To never have this kind of godly sorrow uh, is to not have been yet on the path of life. Fourthly, this sorrow producing repentance is remorseless. It is remorseless. Look at verse 10. Godly sorrow produces a repentance without regret. Without regret, without remorse, without a look back. The the only other use of this word in the New Testament comes from Romans 11.29. In Romans 11.29, he's describing Israel's future salvation on the basis of God's character. And he says in his explanation, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, unturned backable, unregretted, without remorse, no changing, no, no turning back, not even a, a hint of, of going back on this thing. And, and this sort of a intense word is used the same way here. A, a godly sorrow produces a, a, a regretless repentance, a, a remorseless repentance. Again, this gets to the idea of a 180 degree turn. I was going this way. I discovered this thing in my life I was, I was going after. I, I was pursuing. I was loving. I was involved in in some way. And, and now, oh, that's displeasing to the Lord. I'm going to turn this way. And, and not do the pillar of salt thing. <laughs> no look back. No, no wistful regret. We talked about last week of the, the, that, that fruit, that rotten fruit. I'm seeing that's a sin and it's tied to all this other stuff in my life. And, and so I'm going to pluck that fruit off and throw it away. And sometimes, you know, I, I did kind of like it though. It just, it just means we, we haven't done all the work we need to do on that particular foul fruit. There's still a love for it, a regret. Uh, maybe I kind of liked that sin. Maybe I wish I hadn't repented sometimes. Turn your Bibles to Jeremiah 44. Jeremiah here is addressing those who didn't obey the Lord, didn't love the Lord, didn't go out to the Babylonians with the Babylonian captivity and then be preserved in Babylon by God for a future restoration to the land. Instead, they took matters into their own hands. They said, we're not going to serve Yahweh. We don't trust Yahweh. In fact, there are other gods. There are other nations. We're going to lean on Egypt. And they worshiped the Egyptian gods. They burned incense to the queen of heaven, according to verse 17. And Jeremiah is telling them, stop, repent, turn to the Lord, and you'll be fine. Verse 17 says, but rather, we're not going to listen to you. We will certainly carry out every word that has proceeded from our mouths, uh, which is a stark contrast to everything that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord through Jeremiah. We're going to listen to us 
by burning incense to the queen of heaven, by pouring out drink offerings to her, just as we ourselves, our fathers, our kings, and our princes did in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Do you see what they're saying? They're in Egypt running away from home in rebellion against the Lord. And he's got them there precisely because they did these things they just admitted. And they said, nope, we're going to keep doing it. And then they said, for then we had plenty of food and we were well off and saw no evil. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything. We've met our end by the sword and the famine. It's this a really remarkable admission. They're in trouble with Yahweh because they were worshiping false gods. So they're banished from the land and their homes. And in their banishment, where they will all die in their rebellion, uh, none of them are going to come back to the land. They go on doing the very same sins that got them in trouble in the first place. But notice, at some point, they stopped. Look at verse 18. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven. Do you notice that? There, there was a repentance. But it was a repentance with regret. A repentance with remorse. By the way, did they pour out drink offerings to the queen of heaven because she's so wonderful? Why were they doing it? Who's really the God in the equation? Full bellies, prosperity, comfortable life, getting what we want. Like all idolatry, it is the worship at the altar of self. And who can get it for us? Yahweh's not letting me love myself the way I want. Yahweh's not giving me the stuff I think I need. I'll go get it from some other deity. And listen, Satan's okay with that. Satan's not jealous for singular loyalty. He's okay if you worship the Antichrist. Or the false prophet, or the queen of heaven, or Ashtara, or any other false thing by different names. It's all under his banner. This was a, a repentance with regret in Jeremiah 44. And it's tempting for us to think, okay, God's pointing out something in my life, and my life is troubled Maybe if I clean this up and get right with the Lord, my life will go good again. And then it doesn't for a couple of days and you're like, ah, forget it, going back to my sin. That's the Jeremiah 44 repentance with regret. It's not godly sorrow leading to real repentance. This is the dog returning to its vomit. Rather than a repentance without regret that says, I will have godliness no matter what it costs me. Uh, Give me Jesus, take the world. I have him, I have everything. I don't care about my reputation. I don't care about consequences. I don't care about never having the pleasure that sin provided. A repentance without regret just says, Whatever God has for me, as long as I have him. What are some indications that this kind of repentance in us is incomplete or, or maybe lacking altogether? If we're like the dog returning to vomit. I think if we chafe under discipline, God's trying to get our attention. God, I don't want you to get my attention right now. I'm busy with this idol. Perhaps if we chafe under the consequences, the the results of our sin are unbearable. God, this is too much for me. Um, Was God's bearing with our sin and his patience too much for him? It was was the cross of Christ where he took our sins to Calvary too much for him? And has God not promised to not give us more than we can bear? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, and always have a way of escape. It's not too much. And and we may say sometimes, well, I just disagree with the way it was handled. Yes, you found out my sin. Yes, here's the results. Here's the things that need to happen. But, you know, you guys did it wrong. That's That's a common response from a heart that is not saying, whatever it takes, whatever it takes for me to be godly, that's what I want. Whatever imperfect vessels or vehicles or, or even evil 
tyrants. Think Babylonian Empire in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the plan of God to purge Israel. Remember how troubled Habakkuk was at that? You know, God, you're too holy. You wouldn't bring the Babylonians to, to punish us, would you? Yes. I'm going to do more than you think I'm going to do in that regard. And a repentance that is half-hearted complains about God's processes. Fifthly, this godly sorrow produces a repentance that is contrasted. It's contrasted. Verse 10. But the sorrow of the world brings about death. So here we have the contrast between uh, verse 9, a godly sorrow. Verse 10, the godly, godly sorrow producing repentance. And a worldly sorrow producing something else. And the New American Standard has the word produces for both words. Uh, Legacy Standard Bible has two different words. These are two different words here. Um, the, the second word, the, the worldly sorrow producing death, is a, is a more intense word. It's designed to get the attention of the reader and say, no, it, it really brings about something you don't want. Uh, a worldly sorrow produces death. And, and this is confusing for us sometimes. Look, look at Hebrews 12. I think if you, were, you and I were on the scene of, of Esau's life, who traded his inheritance for immediate gratification in a bowl of soup. Verse 17 of Hebrews 12. You know that afterwards, when Esau desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought for it with tears. There's a kind of sorrow that is not accompanying repentance. And, and if you and I were looking at Esau weeping over his bowl of half-eaten soup, we would probably have sympathy. We would probably say, oh, look at this guy. He, he's so repentant. Well, we would say he's sorrowful. What is God's assessment of him? It's a, it's a worldly sorrow. Judas similarly expressed the, the worldly sorrow and, and the intensification of the word producing here in verse 10 is, is significant because what is produced by worldly sorrow? Not relief. I mean, we, we, we understand that the physiology of crying actually results in a euphoric experience. You want to be happy, just cry more because after you're done crying, you physically feel better. Um, what does this sorrow lead to? Death. Death. This, the stakes couldn't be higher. This is not the repentance on the path of life. This worldly sorrow contrasted with godly sorrow leads to death. Sixth, this godly sorrow is said to be earnest. Look at verse 11. Behold what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has brought about in you. Earnest is the word for speed or quickness or a willingness, an eagerness. There's something I need to be doing. I'm going to do it right now. The, the godly sorrow, the kind that produces true repentance, is diligent. It's not lazy. It does not procrastinate. And I want you to think about some Proverbs from the book of Proverbs related to work ethic that I think apply nicely to repentance. Listen to Proverbs 10.4. Poor is he who works with a negligent hand, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. And Proverbs 12, 24, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the slack hand will be put to forced labor. Now, in neither of those Proverbs does Solomon tell us um, what kind of workplace, what's being made. Is, is this a, a locomotive engineer? Is this a guy making widgets in a factory? Is this the, the trash collector? Wh whatever the realm of work involved, the, the principle holds. Uh, lazy, procrastinating attempts at labor uh, will make you poor and will make you a slave. Uh, you, you want to not be a slave? You, you want to be prosperous in what you're doing? You want to be successful? Work at it. Be diligent. Now, let's just insert into these Proverbs the work of repentance. We talked about godly sorrow being active. It's producing something. What's on the production line here? A turning from sin. Listen, don't apply a slack hand to these things. 
Don't procrastinate or, or you won't have fruits for your labors. Don't be lazy or you'll be a slave. Go after these things with earnestness. Do you want to be poor in the Christian life? Do you want to be unsuccessful, unfruitful, a slave to patterns of sin? Godly sorrow produces an earnestness, quick and diligent to respond to sin appropriately. Number seven, godly sorrow is vindicating, vindicating. The word here is apologia. We get our word apologetics. Uh, We think about making a defense of the faith. We we think about vindicating the truth. Of course, uh, the the truth of God's word vindicates itself. We we merely present those truths and, and they do the work. But that same word is used here. For a vindication of self. And and this is not a self-defense like I need to justify my actions. Sure, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm turning from my sin. But but you need to understand why I did what I did. You you Think about those words. And, and we do that so often. We, we try to give explanations. We, we blame shift. We... We, we want people to understand why we sinned. And, and if we just back up and think about what sin is and, and just sort of restate that for a moment. Hey, I know I hurt your feelings, but I really need you to understand why I was so opposed to the rule of God over the universe that I wanted to dethrone him with my own love of self. And I was willing to lie, cheat, and steal to get what I wanted. Don't you understand? <laughs> This takes us back to just thinking about sin the way God does. And and a godly sorrow helps us do this. Expanding our confession list like we did last week helps us do this. And the vindication here is not justifying my actions or or blame shifting. You know, know, I'm sorry I yelled at you when you called me a jerk. (laughs) You know, where we we put the onus on, on the offended party for our sin. Sometimes we, we use our confessions to try to manipulate a confession out of somebody else. What, what I really want is for that guy to feel bad about what he did. So, so uh, you know, I'm really sorry I hurt your feelings. Now it's your turn. Now, that's not a, a biblical repentance. That's not a, a biblical confession. That doesn't come from godly sorrow. That is still a love of self. When Paul commends the Corinthian vindication of themselves, he's not congratulating excuse making. He's saying of them that their godly sorrow produced a repentance that is itself a defense of the work God did in their hearts. Their repentance vindicates the turn from the heart before the Lord. The repentant one is clearing his name as it were, not as if he didn't sin, but that he has truly done a 180 and is putting distance between himself and that sin. I'm running away from it. This welcomes the gravity of consequences. It owns the offenses. It expresses sorrow over the offense. The sorrow does not demand that the offended party extend forgiveness or love or reconciliation. And we do that sometimes, don't we? I mean, listen, it, it's, a, it's a huge mountain of pride to conquer, like an Everest in our hearts, to get to the place where we say, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I sinned, and I sinned against heaven, and against you, dad, or whatever the, whatever the case may be. You, you think of the prodigal son, what did it take for him to get to the place where he said, I'm not worthy to be your son, take me as your slave. It's a huge battle to get there. And and if you fought that battle and won in any degree, you're coming down the backside of the mountain. You've you've just enjoyed the thrill of knowing your sins have been removed and you stand justified before God and Jesus is your advocate. And the accuser of the brethren can have nothing to say when Jesus is standing there on your behalf. You're coming down the mountain with a big smile on your face and you're confessing that sin that you've been forgiven vertically to the person you offended horizontally. And they're not quite there with you that yet celebrating. <laughs> Why? Because you, you brought hurt. Your sins affected someone else and there's a broken relationship. Now, we, we, we love that father of the prodigal who had the, had the robe ready and ran to his son. 
and slaughter the fattened calf. And we could be tempted to think, yeah, that's what my wife should do uh, when, when I finally get around to climbing Mount Everest and, and confessed an unkind word. She should celebrate. Where's the steak? <laughs> Godly sorrow does not demand the response. And, and it's still sin when we say, hey, I sinned against you and I said I'm sorry, all right. So now it's on you to forgive me or else you're sinning. And we just burden the other person. We're complicating our initial sin, multiplying it. Sorry was a good word. Do you remember when it meant, I have sorrow? It can sort of come across sometimes as, I'm sorry, what else do you want from me? Get off my back. I think there's still a good way to use it. Uh, But there are bad ways to use that word too. The more sanctified version of the get off my back is sort of the, uh, after a, a vertical and horizontal confession, we expect God to take away the consequences. And we expect others to immediately trust us and express the fondest affections with no lingering effects of our sin. And this is a message for another time. In fact, we, several equipping hours ago, we talked about forgiveness and And how it is a sin to harbor bitterness, to be reluctant to forgive. But today we're talking about the offending party and not putting the burden on the offended. Number eight, godly sorrow producing repentance is indignant. Verse 11, indignant. What indignation this godly sorrow brought about in you, Paul says. This is the only place this word is used in the New Testament. It's a passionate word. It it means to even be angry over some injustice, some wrong done. What is the godly man angry over? Over his own sin here. Over that sin's offense against the character of God and its effects on others. This is where our template from last week helps us. We, we need to see what that sin truly is. And the closer we get to God's definition, the better placed we will be to hate our sin. Psalm 119, 104 says, From your precepts, from your word, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. Now, the hypocrite thinks first and foremost about every false way out there. <laughs> And, and the one who's run the Christian life for a while close to Jesus is saying, first, oh, I hate all the false ways in here still. As Brian Arnold, a pastor at Grace Emanuel Bible Church in Jupiter, in his sermon from this text said, you will not turn from a sin that you do not hate. You won't turn from a sin that you don't hate. So this indignance is an important part of godly sorrow. Number nine, godly sorrow producing repentance is accompanied by fear. It is afraid. Again, look down at verse 11. What fear this godly sorrow has brought about in you. Negative experiences produce subsequent fears. I happen to love elevators. I think it's a marvelous invention. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by how they work. All the machinery is hidden and you just, you're in this beautiful box. I've never even felt a tinge of elevator phobia until I got stuck in one this summer. Now I, I'm just not quite so sure about those things. What are your phobias? The dark? Spiders? Cancer? Grizzly bears? Tight spaces? Maybe you suffer from what Gary Larson called luposlipophobia. Do you know that one? It's the fear of being pursued by timber wolves around a kitchen table while wearing socks on a newly waxed floor. Maybe you're afraid of getting cancer in a small dark elevator full of spiders and grizzly bears. Whatever it is, fears are real and they're usually grounded in something that happened, some experience. Are you afraid to sin? Are you afraid to sin? Are you afraid that the sin that you just got tangled in will wrap its cords around you again? 
A fear of sin, a fear of sin's effects on others, a fear of sin's offense to the God that I love, a fear of sin's consequences, a fear of entanglement, of uselessness and apostasy. These are rational fears. And they are fears that ought to have already been generated in you by experience. Fear God and be afraid to sin. This is the posture of a godly man. Our response to our sin in our repentance needs to include a fear of sinning again. Romans 13, 14, Paul says, make no provision for the flesh. A fear of grizzly bears will cause you to carry large caliber firearms and bear spray into the woods. Or will make you never go into the woods again. What fear do you have of your own proclivities? your own tendencies, your own weaknesses and temptations. Reread Proverbs 5 and 6 and 7. The fool goes near the house of the wayward woman. At dusk, hanging out on the street corners. Don't go near her house. Don't turn down her street. Don't allow your heart to entertain the desire. Be afraid to sin. Number 10, yearning. Again, in verse 11, what longing, Paul says, this godly sorrow has brought about in you. In the New Testament, this word for longing is a a strong desire for something, often of persons. Paul said of the Romans in in the letter to, to Rome, how I long to see you. He said the same thing in Philippians 4 to believers at Philippi. 1 Peter 2 describes longing for the pure milk of the word. Uh, How does a a baby crave its mother's milk? That's how you should crave God's word. Interestingly, in the book of James, the same word is used of the Holy Spirit's strong desire, there translated jealousy, for the believer's spiritual loyalties. What does the godly man yearn for in his repentance? A strong desire, a longing for, a yearning for freedom from the grip of this particular sin. A strong desire to do what's right. It comes with a strong desire to do whatever it takes to do what is right. Is there a cost too high? Is there a hurdle too large? If it means this sin will be put to death? That is a godly repentance. Number 11, it is zealous. Zeal is an intense interest and dedication to something. What comes to your mind when you hear the word zealot? A devotee to a cause who cannot be turned aside. He cannot be distracted. He's sold out and committed to the cause. Godly sorrow produces repentance that comes with zeal. An intense devotion to a new path. The opposite direction from the sin Willing to make great sacrifices to have the victory. Number 12, this godly sorrow is avenging. Look at verse 11. What avenging of wrong this brought about in you. Vengeance we normally associate negatively. It's wrong to repay evil for evil. To retaliate, to punish others for wrongs done against us. For the exacting of injustices committed. But here... This word is tied positively to godly sorrow and repentance. Of course, we're not talking here about paying back others for wrongs against us. That's sin. But in godly repentance, the perpetrator is me. I'm also the one eager to make wrongs right, but they're my wrongs. And so we ask, what restitution needs to be made? What effects of my sin need to be set right? Do you remember Zacchaeus? He encounters Jesus and the grace of God and meeting Jesus. And he says, whatever I've stolen from people, I'll pay it back four times over. Well, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. (laughs) He was a fraud and a sellout, a traitor to his nation. He was on the, the lowest rung of all the crimes considered bad in Israel in his day. He was the worst of the worst of the worst. Pick your vilest offenders in your mind. That's where Zacchaeus was. I don't know how long he'd been doing it. I don't know how much he'd made. But that is serious restitution. 
That heartbeat is what's in view here. How, how do I make this right? And godly sorrow does not account any temporal consequences as too steep. If there's forgiveness for our crimes before the soaring bar of God's high holiness, and if we are accounted by Him as loved, accepted, adopted, declared righteous in His courtroom, then we already have in the gospel received an infinite and undeserved gift. What more do we want? If we never got another good thing in this life, we have infinitely beyond what we deserve in God's love. We have free access to God himself, the treasure of treasures, and eternal life. Additionally, we get many blessings in this life we don't deserve. None of us get all that we deserve for our sins. I think God is very kind to keep back the infinite reflex of his justice even in our consequences and disciplines for our sins. We may be facing consequences for our sin, but we, we rarely, if ever, even get the consequences appropriate to our sins. God is so patient with us. And so any complaint in the process that it's too hard, or the consequence is too great, or the treatment unfair, doesn't come from a heart of sorrow that says, I want to make everything right. Avenging of wrongs. And then the last description, number 13, is holy. This godly sorrow leading to repentance is holy. Look at verse 11. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. And the word innocent there is just the word for holy. You're holy in the matter. You're you're pure in the matter. In this case, a holiness uh, referring to being set apart from sin. The repentance that Paul described in the Corinthian believers resulted in their newfound reputation as being separated from the sin they had perpetrated. They had done something, but they were filled with this godly sorrow and they turned. And now what were they known for? They were known for the turning more than they were known for the sinning. And to paraphrase what what many have said before, you know a man is repentant when he is known more for his repentance than for the sin he repented of. Think about these 13 descriptions. Do they characterize the way you think about turning from sin? This this passage is designed to to help us self-evaluate our response. And and we need to grow in this, don't we? (laughs) Is there a flawless repentance? I I don't think there's ever been a flawless repentance. Jesus never needed it. He's the only one that never sinned. He's the only one that could have repented sinlessly, but he couldn't have repented because he didn't sin to get there. Our repentances are tainted and flawed. We're in a mixed condition. All the... All the men who have walked with Christ, the men and women who have walked with Christ a long time, have have prayed prayers similar uh, to to what the Puritans prayed. Our our repentances need repenting. Our our tears need weeping. Our prayers need prayed over. (laughs) We are weak in this. My encouragement is to stay in the fight. Use this as a template. Evaluate your turning and take these things before the Lord. Don't forget the gospel and tune in for the introspective OCD Christian, obsessive compulsive Christian, the the, the kind that that is second guessing, well, did did I repent right? This is again is where we need to take comfort in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, you're a liar. But if we agree with God about our sin and, and, and embedded in all of that, let's just think about a, a godly repentance, godly sorrow that brings about that kind of confession. If we confess our sin, here's what we know about God. He is faithful and he is just to cleanse us from our sin. That is, there's no double jeopardy. If it's paid for at the cross, it's paid for. You cannot be punished for it again, which is why fatherly discipline is not punishment. Consequences are not punishment. God loves you, Christian. But not only does he cleanse you from all the unrighteousness you confessed, but he also cleanses you from the things you didn't know to confess, according to 1 John 1 night. 
He is faithful to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We bank on those things. I have on the screen some resources. Uh, these are on the, the note sheet on the website. Uh, you can snap a picture of those if you want, or if you want to email uh, me, I'll send them to you. Um, but a number of books on the doctrine of repentance. And the last one on the list is a, a link to Brian Arnold's sermon on this text called The Marks of True Repentance. Uh, there's a, a note sheet available there as well as a link to the sermon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again come to you thanking you for the gift. The gift initially of, of turning to you from every false thing. We could not have done that on our own as slaves of sin, blinded by Satan, in love with the world and at enmity with you. Only you could overcome all of those barriers and supernaturally cause us to be born again with faith and repentance from the heart. Thank you. Thank you as well for a, a battle plan for dealing with those things inside us that are displeasing to you. Help us enlist all of your resources to that battle and let us be encouraged again by what your son has done in our place. It's in his name we pray. Amen.